Okay, so we are going to get this started. Hello, I'm Jason Williams from the DNA Learning Center. And uh, welcome to the second episode of DNA Barcoding Live. Uh, we are just making sure everything looks good here in the stream. And then we will see uh, the presentation that I have and the slides. So just giving a second for everything to catch up. And now that I see it's going well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, awesome. So uh, once again, uh, this is Jason Williams coming to you from the DNA Learning Center in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Uh, and this is DNALC Live. Uh, this is our experiment to really serve everybody who's learning from home right now. We are super interested in your feedback and what you'd like to see from us. So I'll point out in a little bit where you can give us that feedback, uh, including going to the website and also watching on the uh, YouTube live stream. Uh, the purpose of the DNALC Live experiment, uh, this DNALC Live presentation is really to provide uh, education across the range of things that DNA Learning Center does, molecular biology, genetics, bioinformatics. We're going to be doing, and you're going to see shortly, pay attention to our site this week. We have had, I think, about 17 events planned for next week. Uh, so short courses, computer demos, all sorts of activities, including interviews with scientists, help for teachers. Uh, so stay tuned. Please make sure that you uh, know our DNA Learning Center website from wherever you're watching, including the DNLC Live page. And uh, be sure to follow us and like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Those are great ways to give us feedback and let us know a little bit more about what you'd like to see from us. So this is part two of barcoding bioinformatics. And if you uh, go to the DNA Learning Center or the YouTube page, you'll find part one. If you missed it, I'll do a quick recap before we get started. Um, just a reminder, this course is best suited for students who are taking or have completed AP Biology. And also I think it's suitable for people in undergraduate biology sort of introductory. If you haven't taken those courses, uh, you're welcome to watch and get as much as you can. But certainly if you've taken at least that much, you'll be a little bit more grounded. Uh, these lectures are going to be, uh, well, not just lectures, but they're gonna be hands-on activities too. They're about 45 minutes a week and we're gonna follow along with DNA Subway. You can get a free account if you haven't done so. Also, you want to check the DNA Learning Center live webpage for slides and packets. Those are updated every week, so there's more things to follow along that go with each episode. Okay, so here are the learning goals for this overall course, and then I'm going to talk about what today's activities are. Overall, we're talking about how we use DNA to identify unknown organisms, and we're going to understand, and that was most of uh, last week's topic, how do you obtain the sequence quality and uh, how do you understand what it means to have DNA sequence and, and know whether it's good sequence or bad sequence. Today, we're going to focus on BLAST, uh, which is the computational method that we use to identify unknown DNA sequences. It's actually part of the AP Bio Lab 3 curriculum. And also uh, next week's episode, the last one in the series, is going to be comparing DNA sequences using phylogenetics. And then we'll announce a new series. We'll probably redo this one again so I get even better at it. Uh, but that's what's coming up. Uh, you'll want to go to DNA Subway. Uh, which you can Google DNA Subway or go to cyverse.org. We recommend you get an account, but it's not required. If you get an account, your work will be saved. Um, but you can also go ahead and follow along, even from today, using uh, a guest account. Okay, so this episode is all about uh, sequence cleaning and blast. So we're going to pick up a little bit from last week. Uh, the steps that we have to do this week, we're going to do the recap and just make sure you know where we were last week, how we got there. We're going to make sure you understand really sequence quality. I'm going to add into that. I've got a lot of slides today about experimental design. Uh, that's really, really important. We're going to do the sequence cleaning and pairing, and we're going to give you an introduction to BLAST. Okay, so what about the last data set? So as you recall, the steps for DNA barcoding is that we sample our organisms, we extract DNA, and then we use a technique called PCR to barcode it. We also have another technique called DNA sequencing, which I covered last week, uh, which gives you DNA sequence. Now, all of these wet lab steps, that's what we would call them, all of those first steps, uh, if you're a bioinformatician, you probably aren't doing those yourselves. Uh, you really wait until you get the data. And then once you have the data, you can actually do something with it. So that's the part we are 
at. And really by the end of this, especially next episode, when you see those individual DNA sequences, they amount to unique barcode for every species on the earth. Now, uh, I was missing this slide last time, so I wanted to make sure I got it in there. These were some of our winners from when we started doing this all the way back in 2012. Uh, and their experiment, and just give an example of what you can do with this, they were actually looking at samples of uh, leaves and medicines and teas uh, because they had collected uh, these samples from drug stores and medicinal stores that claim to sell ginkgo supplements. And maybe, you know, maybe you've taken ginkgo for your personal health. You thought it would be something uh, that could improve your um, disposition or whatever ginkgo does for you. But what they found was that in all of the samples they tested, there was absolutely no ginkgo. And part of the reason why this is interesting, because, okay, if you take a ginkgo leaf off a tree, hopefully you've seen one. I don't have a good picture of one who's a dried one. You know what ginkgo looks like, but in the form of a capsule or a tablet or tea, you don't know at all what it looks like. And in fact, I didn't put it here, but the results that they found uh, ultimately were confirmed by the New York State Attorney General. And so with that, they uh, were actually, many of these places were issued cease and desist orders. <laughs> so. Uh, it was actually verified that this was the case, that most of this stuff ended up being rice and other things, but not ginkgo. So that's the type of experiment that you carry out. Now, in our case, the data set that we're looking at is from mosquito. And the challenge was that we have different species, uh, in fact, actually different genuses of mosquitoes. Um, but uh, as adults, why they have a lot of morphological distinctions as larvae, uh, which is actually, if you are in the mosquito control business, which if you didn't know in some places, especially let's say Florida, uh, you have entire units of public health developed and uh, you know, devoted to mosquito control. As larvae, they're almost indistinguishable. And so if you're trying to figure out what's the right pesticide or what mosquitoes do I have in the area, when you look at the larvae, it's very difficult to tell what you have. And this is important because they carry different diseases. So in a public health situation, what you're looking for is to make sure you know what mosquitoes are in the area. And if there is potentially an outbreak of something, then you have an idea of what you might need to do to combat it. And you wanna not discover that potentially when you have the mosquitoes, you wanna discover that when you have the larvae and you can treat them before they actually hatch. Um, the other thing that's really key when we're talking about bioinformatics is I want people to really understand and really appreciate because it's sometimes difficult that when we are talking about bioinformatics, and this is going to be a goal for today, we are actually talking about experimental design. We are doing an experiment. So sometimes folks feel that when they are just messing around with code or working with data, it's not an experiment. And that's the wrong way to approach it. Not only because philosophically it's not true, but also if you're not really thinking about it as an experiment, you may not bring over all of the great uh, science skills that you have to doing experiments in the wet lab uh, to the dry lab or the bioinformatics lab. So what I've done is I've broken down uh, some things into terms you might be familiar with or might be used to thinking about. And I'll try to relate those back to how we are doing it in this course. Uh, so the first thing that we have, if we think about our materials rather than chemical reagents, we have two data sets. One of them that we could have produced ourselves and the other one is actually a shared data set that nearly all scientists use. And we're gonna be talking about that when we go to BLAST. The, the materials for our experiment are the DNA from the unknown mosquito samples. So that's something you could generate in the lab. And in fact, with the barcoding programs we do at the DNA Learning Center, you can go ahead and you know, do that experiment. It takes about an hour or so to get the, get the DNA. Um, and then you send it off for sequencing, have about and back a day. The second one we're gonna talk about is we have data from, DNA from known samples. So those are our materials. And we also have a hypothesis. Now, the hypothesis, which is going to center around today's work and also in the next episode, is that using co computational methods, we would be able to infer what the species is. So given an unknown sample and given something to compare it to, if we use the right methods, which includes the right settings and really understanding just a little bit about how those methods work, we could infer what the species is. So we want to get away from the idea although DNA subway makes things easy, that just because you have a result in front of you that it must be the answer, uh, we're gonna dive deep into that a little bit later. And the other thing is that we also have controls. And I talked about this a little bit last time, but now it's even a little bit more important. Uh, so 
we have these things called sensitivity controls. I'm gonna mention positive and negative controls, but I'm gonna elaborate on this in a second. The sensitivity controls tell us a little bit about our experiment and what's the probably, you know, what's the, the, our ability in reality to measure something that we hope to measure. And so those are gonna be related to the, our ability to tell whether our sequence quality is of good quality or of poor quality. And it's also gonna rely upon the parameters that we use when we use this software called BLAST. There are some settings we could change or not change or things we need to think about in order to have a better understanding if our BLAST results actually tell us what we think they're telling us. The other thing is, is that we also have positive and negative controls. So we have outgroup sequences. So in file genetics, we use the word outgroup to mean uh, something that we're comparing to. So these are non-mosquito DNA. And as you'll see, if you remember from last time, and we'll see again, we've got some related DNA that's not mosquito, mosquito. So that's kind of a negative control. And we've also got known samples. And the known samples are things that we're pretty sure are really mosquito. So really when you're experimenting, uh, even if you're doing bioinformatics, you really should think about hypothesis and controls because it really is all science and it really all comes down to being able to do all of those things. Okay, so we're gonna review sequencing and quality. I just wanna say a moment about that. I don't wanna spend a lot of time there because we spent time there last time, but we did cover what a DNA sequencing experiment uh, is like or where it comes from. Uh, please go back and watch uh, the other video and or search the DNA Learning Center website on cycle sequencing because there was a detailed explanation along with some animations that explain how uh, DNA sequencing works. Uh, so you want to have that information so that you can uh, actually understand where our data came from. The other thing that we generated from that data, and which we're going to go back to in DNA subway bit, is the chromatogram and electrophorogram. And why not, since we're here talking about it, just pull this up for a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my slides, and I'm going to go ahead and share my entire desktop so that we can see uh, everything. Well, I guess I can share, actually, the web browser, because it has DNA subway open. Okay, so what you wanna do now, if you have not already done so, is you might wanna join me on DNA Subway and you go to, go to dnasubway.cyverse.org or you can Google for DNA Subway. If you're using as a guest, you can go ahead and click enter as guest. And if you are um, using it uh, if with your account, uh, if you have one, go ahead and sign into your account. Uh, if I type my password correctly, then it will let me in. Okay, awesome, it let me in, uh, which means I remember my password. Now I see my experiment from last time, I'll click on that in a second, but if you are starting an experiment, if you're joining us for the very first time, uh, just to quick catch you up as quickly as I can, what you need to do is click on CO1 because we're using that particular gene, a particular locus. We'll talk more about that next week. And then you want to choose the data set, Intro to Barcoding Bioinformatics Mosquitoes. You can give yourself a title. This doesn't matter very much. And then click Continue. And then you'll basically be just about where I am at right now. What I'm going to do is go back to my Save Projects and go back to my Webinar Project. OK, and so this is where we were last week. And we really only got up to, by design, the Sequence Viewer. And on the Sequence Viewer, from the DNA sequencing experiment, what we actually get out is this raw data. Now, raw data is data that has not been interpreted or edited in any way. Uh, it's what comes off the machine. And in fact, uh, the other thing that is uh, important for thinking about raw data is that if I just gave you this DNA sequence and you looked at it and you know, I'm just zooming in with my computer here, these A's, C's, T's, and G's all look the same, right? But what you really wanna think about and the message from last week about sequence quality is that if you click on an individual sequence, you actually get this electropharogram or chromatogram. Sorry that it has two names. I don't know which one I prefer. I think I prefer chromatograms. I'll, I'll try to stick with that. And the, the goal for you to understand is, is that when we look at sequence data, look at sequence quality, those A's, C's, T's, and G's are not all equal. If we scroll down, okay, we can actually see that those bars going across the top, which I reminded you last time, have to do with sequence quality, and which we're gonna um, deal with in just a moment a little bit deeper. 
uh, mean that these A's, C's, T's, and G's are not all the same, okay? And uh, especially this is an artifact of the way that sequencing runs. At the very first few nucleotides of Sanger sequencing, the quality is a little bit lower. And that comes from the fact that those uh, those uh, pieces of DNA are very low molecular weight. They're only a few base pairs, 10 base pairs, 20 base pairs. And so they sort of smear on the gel and they don't come out with as much high quality. Now you can definitely tell that it's low quality if it's an N because N basically means undetermined. It stands for the word any, the N and any. Uh, so those are definitely low quality. But up here, uh, we have an A followed by an N followed by an A. If you were just looking at the raw sequence without the chromatogram, you might be fooled. So uh, we need to understand sequence quality. The key insight, I'm gonna go back to the slides from last time, uh, is that when we're looking at that sequence quality, we do have, oops, I wanted to share my slides. One second, uh, PowerPoint, there we go. The key message from last time was that you know you can have a difference in quality and that we actually have a way to quantify that. And so the message was to look up something called a FRED score. And this is the way that we determine what sequence quality is. Uh, the FRED scores, it's actually a log scale, it runs from 10 to 50. And it gives us an idea of what is the probability that any individual base has been called incorrectly. So in the case of a FRED score of 20, that means you have a one in 100 chance that um, the base is called incorrectly. Now that may not sound so bad, right? A 99%, right? If you came home with a 99% on a test, I'd be happy about that. But actually, when you think about DNA sequencing, um, we actually need to do a little bit better, especially if you consider that the genomes of many organisms are millions or even billions of base pairs long. And so even uh, a very small amount of error, uh, if it's not accurate to a very high degree, it's not enough. So I always like this, uh, this slide, uh, which is if 99% was good enough. In fact, this is actually 99.9% uh, was good enough, 12 newborns would be given to the wrong parents every day. Uh, there would be 100 plus thousand mismatched pairs of shoes. Uh, your mail, 18,000 pieces of mail would be uh, mishandled every hour. Two million documents would be lost by the IRS. Maybe that one is true. Uh, but 99.9% .9 is a really high level of accuracy or precision, you might think, in, in sort of everyday terms. But when we're talking about DNA sequencing, uh, we definitely want to be uh, in that 99.9 .9 or greater uh, percent because often we're dealing with such large numbers. So let me come back to um, the idea of controls and relate it even deeper to sequencing uh, so that people get the point and then we can go on from there. Because in the end, when we're doing this barcoding experiment, the difference of a few nucleotides being different actually matters as to is it species A or species B. So to, to finally nail down, I'm harping on it, but it's important, um, controls, let me just paint a very simple thought experiment for you. Uh, if I had a question, a hypothesis, or, you know, not even a hypothesis, really just a question, at what temperature does ice, you know, uh, you know, H2O, if we add chemical X, whatever that is, I don't know what it is, but if we add chemical ice, chemical X to ice, and we ask the question, uh, at what temperature does that ice melt now that it has chemical X, how would you measure it, and what would be your controls? Okay, as uh, AP bio students or as scientists in general, we need to be able to think this way. So just painting this simple experiment. Well, uh, I mentioned the types of controls before, but let me just reemphasize here. We have positive controls. So what does it look like if the effect is present? So what would you choose? Uh, and you can answer in the chat if you want, but you could just think about it, um, especially if you're not watching this live, but what, it, what would the effect look like if, a, uh, if you have a positive control, what would you choose to be your positive control to find out if ice with chemical X versus ice without it would melt? So you're gonna need a positive control. Then we mentioned negative controls and the negative control answers the question, what does the effect look like if uh, it was absent? What would things look like if the effect was absent? So what would be a negative control for this? And then the third one, which people don't always talk about, but is actually really important when we come to um, that what I'm just talking about in sequencing, across what range of values can I measure the effect? And what this literally relates to 
if I go back just for one second, um, back to that chromatogram, what that literally relates to is if I am measuring uh, my the height, and in fact, actually here, if you look at the different axes, I can increase, I can zoom in on the X or the Y axis, uh, what is the height of these, or the signal is what we would call that, uh, actually is related to the question of across what range of values can I actually determine uh, whether I am measuring what I'm thinking I'm measuring. So when you have a, a very good signal and a strong signal, you get the ability to measure this DNA really nicely. But when that signal degrades, even here when it apparently looks pretty good, but 70 to 80 is a little bit of background noise. And if I go around, often you can see places where there might be signals that are a little bit too close together, or sometimes where you might get a drop of a little bit of background noise. So that's the question that we're interested in. Okay, if I go back to my slides, uh, those are questions that you might think. Now, the, the answers hopefully are pretty um, straightforward. You know, if I want to see, I might have some water to know what it looks like when, when actually, you know, a melted ice cube melts and measure that. And for negative control, I might want to have some ice that doesn't have chemical X and know what it looks like and measure that. And then my sensitivity control is, you know, if I'm taking a measurement, I probably need to have a thermometer in order to answer that question. But does my thermometer tell me what I'm looking for? And in fact, if you look at this thermometer, we know, right, assuming for a second that this is uh, Celsius, that ice is, you know, ice at uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius. So uh, if we look at that, you know, scale, a lot of this thermometer is actually devoted to talk, talking about temperatures that aren't really close to zero. And uh, we have a couple of grade marks on the temperature scale. So we actually might even want a temperature scale that goes below zero. What if I, if chemical X makes the ice more resistant to freezing? And can we get even more uh, precision on our measurement? Those are the types of things that we're thinking about when we're thinking about sensitivity controls. So the, the, to, to summarize it, really, the FRED scores are, are, are part of the, the control there. And the lower the score, the lower the FRED score, that means there's more noise than there is actually signal. And it, it looks like I've put in a really zoomed in piece of where that uh, has gone wrong in that particular piece of DNA. Now, the next thing that you need to know, um, just to mention, and then we'll move on from this and actually come back to doing some cleanup of the sequencing, is that when we sequence the DNA, we often, especially in the case of doing it for uh, barcoding, is we're gonna sequence it in two directions. Uh, we're gonna do the forward and the reverse. This is called bidirectional sequencing. And the purpose of that is so that we get the same nucleotides, okay? But we wanna get them at the very same position on the, on the DNA strand. And the idea hopefully is that if this is a G, and let's say this was a C, it was unknown. The slide is actually a little bit uh, dusty here. Uh, what you wanna be able to do is resolve conflicts if they don't agree. Okay, the reason um, that that works or how that works is that in one tube of, uh, we actually need to do two sequencing reactions. In one tube, we have a primer that's gonna go and bind on the plus strand. And here it binds at the three prime and it's gonna go uh, in this way from right to left. And then we also have another primer in another tube and that is gonna extend itself from left to right. So in that way, we're measuring the DNA strand if you really think a little bit deeper, uh, remember how I told you that the very beginning and then also the very end of your DNA um, f th through sequencing, if, do you recall why I said the very beginning often has low quality? The very beginning often has low quality because the, uh, the molecular weight of the DNA, when you have a bases that are, you know, or strands of replicated DNA that are only uh, five base pairs, 10 base pairs, 20 base pairs, they tend to smear. And then as you extend and you get a longer sequencing or DNA sequencing, typically you get reads up to a thousand base pairs, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, but that's usually as long as they go. But what happens is because it's a probabilistic process, uh, it's hard for DNA to go a thousand nucleotides, and you really have to be an expert on sequencing, uh, without incorporating one of those dideoxynucleotides we talked about last week. So you get less signal, the signal goes down as you get towards the end. But in sequencing it in two directions, what actually happens is that the signal, I'm gonna see if I'm smart enough here. Um, 
I don't want to do this on the whiteboard. I was going to think about annotating, but it, it won't add very much. What you do by also getting bidirectional sequencing is, is that you increase your probability of getting good sequence at the, the uh, five prime n and also at the three prime n. So we sequence twice and that in itself is a control. Okay, next. Uh, and what you're gonna do, what we're gonna see now is that in order to make that make sense, since we're reading the DNA strand in two different directions, we have to do a reverse complement. So we have to flip one strand around and then make its complement. So if this was in the black, the original sequence, um, then if we flip it around, now we go G, A, C, C, T, C, and that's what you have here, and then we complement, then these two will be the same. So what we're gonna actually do is go ahead and do the next two steps. Let me share DNA subway. We're gonna go ahead and do the next two steps to get us to that part. And then we're gonna go ahead and clean up the data. So I'm just gonna zoom out a bit and tell you what's going on. And we're gonna see that. So just recall that every sequence here has a one F and a one R. And the difference between one F and one R is one is sequenced in the forward direction. And then the other one is sequenced in the reverse direction. So the next thing we're gonna do is really quick and then we're gonna get to the reverse complementation. The next thing we're gonna do is click on sequence trimmer. And what sequence trimmer does automatically uh, is pull off most of the ends at either end, okay? So it kind of uh, goes along until it finds a number of ends. And then when it hits uh, a, a dash of nucleotides that are of decent quality, it'll stop trimming. Now, if you look carefully, that's not perfect because there is an end here at the beginning, um, but it is better. And as we go along a little bit further, we can see that it goes on and it will do the same thing at the end. And we have decent, but not perfect quality. If we zoom in uh, towards the end there, even if we bump the signal on the y-axis, uh, you could see that as we get towards the end, we've got some FRED scores that are below the blue line. And the blue line is the 20, that's the cutoff. So if something is below that, um, that's the cutoff. Okay, so um, the other thing that you could see, I'm actually gonna close this and open it is uh, when you look at the raw data, they no longer line up at the end. So, I mean, not that they would have totally done that before, but they've all been trimmed. Okay, so that's a convenience to trim it. We're gonna do even more trimming in a moment. The next thing we're gonna do is go to this thing called the pair builder. Now, as it turns out right now, um, these sequences here are not in uh, the right orientations. There's some of them that are marked F, but if we mark something R, what will happen is it will verse complement it. Now, uh, you cannot see it here, um, or if you're really good with like crossword puzzles or something, when you reverse complement the sequence, you start to see that they are actually uh, somewhat complementary, but it's a bit difficult to tell. We're gonna see that in a, in, a, in a better way in just a moment. What we actually usually need to do is just click on this thing called auto pairing. And what auto pairing is going to do is it realizes that these two sequences are called horsefly and one has an F and one has an R. So it realizes that the F is the forward sequence and the R is the reverse sequence. So it goes ahead and pairs all of those. And then after pairing, um, it uh, reverse complements the ones that are marked as R. And what you need to do after that is go ahead and click on save and it's gonna save your work. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do in order to further the cleanup here is we're gonna use the consensus builder. So if we click on the consensus builder, if you notice, it's gonna take a few more seconds, not a long time to run because we don't have all that many sequences, but it took a few seconds longer. And when you click on that, now there are some changes. So number one, uh, we no longer see on the left-hand side uh, that this is horsefly F and R, it's just horsefly. So we have horsefly and then we have our four unknown mosquito samples, okay? Uh, if you wanted to, for any reason, I'm not gonna do, do that here. You could rename these. Uh, so you're welcome to do that, but uh, we don't need to do it here. What we do need to spend a few moments doing though is looking at this consensus sequence. So 
as I scroll along, first of all, let me make sure we all know a consensus sequence is the sum of both of those two sequences, the F and the R. So at the bottom here is the quote unquote consensus. And if you notice, when I click on a nucleotide, it will actually show me what uh, the sequence uh, is, both from the original F and R at that locus, at that, at that indication. Um, so what are some things to pay attention to while you're doing this? And I'm going to go ahead and do this for all of our samples so we do our project the right way. One, uh, you'll notice that there are some dashes here. And in sequence alignments, dashes stand for missing data. So this is data that we don't have. Um, or they, they, ser they actually ser uh, represent uh, mutations. And that'll be more important next week, where you have an insertion or deletion. Uh, of actual nucleotides, that's called an indel. The other thing you pay attention to is that DNA subway gives you a little bit of clue. If I click on this C here, you can see one of the Cs, uh, well, the C in the consensus, those are always gonna be black, but you could see here that this C is, is, is grayed out. And what that means is that the, the call is of lower quality. So nucleotides that are gray, I probably don't wanna trust very much. That would be bringing in bad data to my experiment. The other thing that you can see is that if these two positions, F and R, so the forward sequence and the right sequence, have data, but they disagree, if you click on the nucleotide, you could see, right, um, on the, the horsefly, the forward read, let me zoom in, make sure you could see that, on the forward read there, there is a T that's cold just at low quality, slightly, you know, it's barely touching that line, and then there's a G at that same position when it's aligned. So the alignment itself may not be perfect, but certainly there's a conflict. If I look here, there is a conflict, right? Uh, you could see that there is a little bit of what we call misalignment. Alignment will be more important uh, next week, but we're trying to line up both the sequences so that they start and stop at the, at the same place. That's the essence of it. So what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is, if I were you, we'd want to trim that consensus sequence so that it only incorporates the, the highest quality data. So for me, what that means is at this horsefly, um, if I look here, I do have some nucleotides, let's say at this position, this looks like 86, where, okay, one of the A's was called an A, but with low quality, but it was called an A and the other in the reverse read with high quality. So I can pretty much trust those reads, but if I wasn't sure, I could look in detail. Rather than look in exactly that much detail this second, what I wanna do is really look, scroll along and really look for the place where I think I can start trusting the sequences, which is usually somewhere after their number ends and maybe not a lot of gray. So if I look at this T here, that's where I think I'm gonna start. So I need to actually trim this. So if I click on trim, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll um, to the position where I think I can start, which I said, okay, let's say I trust this T. What's gonna happen now when I click there is those first nucleotides, in fact, the first 56 on the left, starting from the left, are all gonna be trimmed. So what I'm gonna be left with is a consensus sequence that starts at this T, which in my opinion is a good place to start. And if I scroll towards the end, I'm probably gonna to have to do it here. You could see that, uh, okay, I've got some ends, but after this end, I think towards this end, uh, things look pretty okay. Well, actually, you know what? I don't really like uh, these ends here. So I can maybe be very conservative and trim 94. So I could trim, you don't wanna trim forever, um, but this sequence is by and large pretty high quality on average. So if I wanna be ultra conservative, I could trim there, but actually if I wanted to be a little bit more, get a little bit more data, I could trim here. Um, what you'll see again next week when we do the alignments is that there's a trade-off because if you don't have a lot of data, if you end up trimming it all, then you're not as able to make a comparison. But I'm gonna be happy with those for the moment and click trim. So let's look at some of these other ones. I'm gonna do them a little bit more quickly. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and click on trim consensus. And I just wanna go through all of them and eliminate as much of the data as I think I cannot trust. So that won't take all too long. And also, since I haven't looked through all of these in detail, although the worksheet probably told you to do that, um, it's really up to me to decide right now. And this is maybe the first time I'm really looking at things to decide how I'd like to trim them. So that was mosquito one, mosquito two, go ahead and trim consensus. Okay, that looks safe. 
Let's go here. There's another batch of ends. And if you notice, it looks somewhere on the right hand side between 70 and, eight and 90, uh, you know, as we're looking at them trimming on the, on the front end, it's the first 50 or so. Uh, whoops, I didn't actually trim that. Let's go back and do it. Okay, it's trim here. And so I can't tell you that there's necessarily a right way to do it. Um, but as you look and you learn uh, by the time we're done, you'll get a better sense of, you know, um, can you, where can you trust your data and where might you want to be even more conservative or even potentially a little bit less conservative. So that's mosquito three. Okay, trim, make sure you click trim every time. And mosquito four, trim consensus. I'm gonna go here. And I think uh, around here, Looks like everything is lining up. Let's be a little bit conservative. Okay. Now you could spend, make sure you click trim. Now you could spend a little bit more time if you wanted to, uh, really to go through and try to figure out. Um, and that, that would really help you. Now I see a question from the chat. Uh, what gene are we using? So this is the cytochrome oxidase C, CO1, that we're using uh, in this particular uh in this particular uh, set for animals. And we'll talk more about the CO1 gene next time and why we chose that. Uh, but that's the one that we are, uh, that's, that's the one that we're doing. Uh, there's another question in the chat, which is why when we look at the Sanger sequencing, do we get so many ends at the beginning of the end? So I'll say it one more time. At the very beginning of the ends, uh, that's easier to explain because at the very beginning, I'll stop sharing for a second. Well know if my face is more convincing to tell you why. Uh, at the very beginning of the sequence, you have nucleotides, um, the, the length of the nucleotides uh, that you're reading that have the fluorescent markers are five bases long or 10 bases long or 20 bases long. And that's so small in weight that as it moves to the gel, it's very difficult for the machine that's reading it, the laser, to actually tell the difference between something that is uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 nucleotides in length. As it gets longer, it's easier for the gel to separate by size. And so things don't get smeared as much. Um, the reason at the end of the nucleotide, at the, at when you get towards the end of your sequence, why is it, why you get so many ends is because what has to happen in order for you to get sequence that is, let's say, 1,000 base pairs long is that the first 999 base pairs had to be regular deoxyribonucleic acid, DNTPs, regular DNTP nucleotides. And then on the 1,000th nucleotide, you picked up by random chance one of the dideoxynucleotides that had a fluorescent marker on it. So the probability of going 999 base pairs without even getting a single dideoxy one is lower, right? You're probably more likely to have gotten terminated somewhere along earlier. Uh, and so uh, the signal strength is getting progressively lower as you get towards a longer end of Sanger sequencing. So that's why uh, you get less. So those are the questions I show in the chat and we're gonna keep moving uh, so we can get to the rest of it. And then if we have more questions, we'll come back to it. Okay, so that's where I wanted to get to. We did the um, sequence trimmer, pair builder, consensus builder. We got through those steps really just to clean up our data and get to a point at which we could use it for BLAST. So in the last uh, 20 minutes that we've got here, what I wanna do is take you into BLAST and explain a little bit about that because that's really the important tool for, um, for this experiment. So BLAST is an algorithm for, uh, first of all, let me tell you what it stands for, which is in the title, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. So that's what BLAST stands for. It actually has a meaning. And it's an algorithm for searching a database of sequences. Now, if you're doing bioinformatics, you need to be familiar with the term algorithm and database. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but an algorithm is a method uh, for, uh, you know, a step-by-step -step method for coming to a computational result.
And we'll learn a little bit more about databases because those are our sequences, our collection of known sequences, our positive controls, right? Uh, in some sense, when we're doing an experiment. Now, BLAST sometimes, it's, it's not, not a bad analogy, sometimes called Google for DNA. And um, that's, that's a nice way to think about it. Although it works with more than just DNA, you can work on um, any type of biological sequence, which usually means we're talking about RNA or proteins. And actually it started before Google. So it started in 19, well, the original papers uh, came out in 1985. And then the BLAST paper, I think was like 1990 uh, something. Uh, I have it, I thought I'd change it in the slide, but it's been around for a while. Oh, 1990, okay, there we go. I changed it in one slide, but not the other versus 1998 was Google. And NCBI uh, is what we're gonna be using and as well as DNA Subway. And NCBI is the most popular interface for BLAST, but BLAST is actually software that you can run anywhere. So don't confuse NCBI with um, BLAST. They're, they're, you know, NCBI is one way to use BLAST, but you could actually use it on DNA Subway or you could use it in, in the Linux command line if we get into some of our advanced courses. Now, I'm just gonna make an analogy uh, and I don't wanna get flamed uh, on the internet because it's just an analogy. So it's useful for discussion, but I know it's not the whole picture, but it gives you a little bit of an insight into BLAST. Um, and it may be something that you um, may not have thought about because any type of search uh, is a really cool area of computer science. Uh, if you think about it, that there are, for example, billions of web pages on the internet and you can type in a few search terms and within microseconds, you can get some type of result. So in BLAST, what you wanna think about is that you have a piece of DNA that you know something about and you wanna find, uh, is this piece of DNA, which we usually call our query sequence, is that piece of DNA, um, do we know any other pieces of DNA that are out there that match it? And the idea is hopefully if you got a piece of DNA, let's say from a mosquito that we know exactly what species it is in our, in our context, then if we take our query sequence, which is unknown, we should be able to match it. But unfortunately, because we're talking about a database, that database is filled with lots and lots of DNA sequences. And it basically becomes impossible to say, I'm gonna take my DNA sequence and search millions of DNA sequences. You know, you couldn't do it one by one. Um, you couldn't do it by hand to just find, it's not a look, it's not like looking in a phone book necessarily, although phone books are also another good analogy here, uh, to find in a large database what our actual sequence is. You actually have to do um, some interesting computer science and math. And just to give you an idea, um, the number of sequences that are in GenMate, and this is old, that was like 2016 data, is somewhere on the order of hundreds of millions of sequences. Um, and that um, there are some other resources on NCBI when we talk about just raw nucleotide data, where we're literally talking about quadrillions of nucleotides. So it's a lot of stuff to find and it's not easy to search that. So there are some strategies, you don't have to, and we're not trying to go in this, make the scope, scope of this course too deep, um, but there are a lot of analogies and some things you can, you can kind of understand a little bit uh, that help you understand how BLAST does do the search. One of the things that BLAST does when it does a search is counterintuitively, it chops up your DNA sequence into the, the original paper used the word words. Uh, we use the word kmers, uh, where k is some number. So in this case, I've chopped up my sequence roughly into three nucleotide sequences. So ACT is three nucleotides. So it's a kmer of three, or you could say a threemer. Uh, so on and so forth. And what that eventually allows you to do is make use of search strategies. For example, you could have a bucket that's labeled ACT. And if your sequence starts with ACT, well, then you should be looking at the, all the sequences that start with ACT. You could skip the TCT bucket and the GCT bucket, right? So there are computational strategies that allow you to do that. This is not exactly how it works, right? This is an analogy. So for example, with DNA sequences, the KMERS are usually broken by BLAST into 11 MERS, okay? If that helps you uh, to understand a little bit deeper, I really suggest the paper. And then also, more importantly, and I think you can understand this, is that in biology, biology is messy, right? If I were to search for human DNA sequence, you and I are different, right? So we have to actually be able to accommodate that there may be mutations in sequences or possibly sequencing errors. And we need a search that is still robust to that. So you need to be able to search. I can't do... 
I can't say that just because my sequence started with ACT that I can only look in the ACT bucket. Because what if my sequence, you know, was a 99% match, except that first A was really a G because of a sequencing error mutation. So it doesn't work exactly like this, but BLAST does make use of some of these computational strategies. And you, if you're really interested in that, we can have more courses on the bioinformatics of BLAST. But let's take a quick look first on NCBI, and then also let's go back to Subway and do our BLAST search and take ourselves through really understanding this. So I've got a sequence here. And if you go to the DNA Learning Center live page, I don't think I've shown you that. So let me share that because I wanna make sure you know where this is. If you're following along with the website, there's a, there's a sheet. Um, go to the DNA Learning Center homepage and DNA Center live and you'll find um, barcoding bioinformatics part two. And the part two worksheet is also under resources, the student handout. And from there, you'll find this sequence. So you can follow along with me as much as is possible. Okay, so here's mosquito sequence. You can even copy not just the DNA, it doesn't matter all that much, but you can copy, I don't wanna copy all that other junk. I wanna copy uh, that DNA sequence. So I'm just gonna copy to that clipboard. And this is not really a link. So I'm just gonna go ahead and Google NCBI BLAST. Okay, and I'm at the blast. You can click on usually the first hit. Now, the other thing that I don't have time to go into today, um, and I mentioned a little bit, and I introduced NCBI last time, which is the National Repository uh, at the at NIH, uh, the National Institute Library of Medicine, actually. Uh, it's a national service. So nearly every scientist all over the world deposits their sequence in databases like this. Uh, most of them are mirrored. So there's uh, GenBank in the US, and a lot of people use that one. And there's a few other large ones in Europe and also Asia. Um, there are other ways, as I mentioned, BLAST can be used with proteins, it could be used with other things, but we're gonna go ahead and select nucleotide BLAST. Okay, now, what you can do, I mentioned that our BLAST sequence is a query. So we're gonna go ahead and paste in that sequence that we had. Now, there are a whole bunch of things which people generally don't touch down here. In fact, if I go down, you'll notice, I like the word algorithm, uh, there are algorithm parameters. If we had a few hours or a week and I was even better at this stuff uh, that it was pouring out of my fingers, I selected some of the stuff that I know and you'll see in some upcoming slides, we could talk a little bit more about what these parameters are. And I'll give you a little bit of, of intuition uh, later when I come back to the slides, but I want you to at least know that there are maybe hundreds of ways to do a blast search. And uh, even many scientists don't actually uh, tweak all of these things all the time, um, but they actually are really important to doing your experiment. Just the way that if you were doing an experiment and it told you to add five microliters or something, but maybe if you added six, it would turn out another way, or if you added seven, or if you added two, it would turn out different ways. These are all equivalent in some ways to what we're doing in BLAST. Um, so for right now, we're not gonna touch those parameters. We're gonna leave them in default. Uh, we've, we put, we've pasted our query sequence in, and there are other things we could decide where we want to search. And it's really super cool. This is the first time I saw it. Um, that uh, sometime recently they added coronavirus here. So you could actually do a specific blast on just coronavirus sequences. So they made it really easy. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and leave it on our standard database. So we're searching the entire selection of all possible nucleotides. It's actually the wrong thing to do. And you'll want, you'll show, I'll show you why later. It's not bad, but it's not the best that you can do. And we're gonna choose the algorithm called BLAST and BLAST for nucleotide. There's some other versions of this algorithm. And we're gonna go ahead and click on BLAST. So let's see, uh, it said an error, which is not true. It says there's no data in my query sequence. Let me try that again. All right, so I think actually, I wonder if it doesn't like, ah, I see there's something, looks like a copy and paste here error. You see how, I'll fix the spreadsheet. There's a number one here, that shouldn't be there. So if you're watching the video, don't do what I did. Get rid of that one F, 
and put it where it belongs here. And I'll try to make sure that that's not correct on the, uh, or that's not an error on the spreadsheet. 1F. There we go. So I didn't go into file formats for sake of time, but that messed up my, uh, my experiment. Now, if I click blast, it'll go ahead. Okay, so while that's working, um, I'm gonna let it work in the background because it usually takes a few seconds and I'm gonna go back to my slides while that is happening. We'll come back to those results. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's a whole lot of math actually behind BLAST, which I'm not going to get into with you today. Uh, but as it turns out, remember when I said we're searching NR, um, for any of you who are stats geeks, that's why I'm putting this up here. Uh, it turns out that your BLAST is more sensitive to uh, if you can choose a small database size, so you're not searching everything in the universe. And it kind of makes sense, right? If I had the cho choice uh, of of searching for my best possible match, and I uh, had to search, uh, you know, just my bedroom. Uh, I'm more likely to find a good match versus if I have to search my whole house. It's going to take longer. Um, let's say I'm looking for two socks, right? And uh, if I have to search, if I know all the socks could be just in my room, uh, I'll probably search and find the two socks. If I search and there's black socks lying all over my house. I might be liable to pick up a black sock. Uh, that's not really the best match, but it's black. So I'll go with it anyway. No one will tell the difference, right? It's roughly <laughs> in some ways the same as to uh, choosing our database parameters. Um, what we're gonna do, uh, what happens in the BLAST algorithm is that it's matching up your query sequences of Mark Q to the search sequences in the database. And sometimes there'll be perfect matches and sometimes they won't be. Um, and so, and we see anytime we have this bar between them, that's a perfect aligned match, but maybe there's a mutation in one of them, or maybe there's an addition. So uh, it scores those and gives a score to those matches. And um, it uses a formula basically saying that you should penalize the match if it's not a perfect match. And you can, to a greater or lesser extent, determine what your penalties are uh, for having a mismatch or for having a gap. Okay, so we've done the blast and let's go back and take a look at it, what it looks like. Okay. All right, so the result took a few seconds, but when we come back are a, res a search results, which we're also gonna do in DNA Subway now. So we've come back and uh, looked and seen that uh, it comes back with the whole things that are 80s, which are our genus, uh, an 80s vexin. Now, on the right-hand side, there are some terms called max score, total score, query, e-value, percent identity. I'm going to briefly explain those, um, but one of the first cool things is that you're actually coming back. We know that the question was asked what gene we're looking at, and this is definitely coming back as cytochrome oxidase subunit 1. If we click on any one of these, it's going to show us our query sequence and how well it matched to the sequence that's in the database. And if we look at that, um, it's a 99% identical match. And that's really nice. And the other thing is, is that it comes back with uh, a very important value that I want people to focus on called the expectation value, which is what is the probability that you would get a match like this by random chance? Okay, let's go back to our slides and we'll deduce this a little bit more. We'll do the blast search in Subway and then we'll talk about what's coming up next time. So let's go back to my slides. Okay, so the max score is the uh, highest alignment. So of the, spe of the uh, sequences that are in the database, the NCBI database has millions of, of hundreds of millions of species uh, of sequences, which one had the highest alignment score? Less, you know, lower number of mismatches, lower number of gaps. What was the percentage that was covered in the alignment? So 99% of the coverage. Um, the E value, like I said, what's the chance that you would get such a match just by random chance, right? And What's the percent identity? How similar in terms of actual nucleotides matching? Um, this is worth a lot of discussion. We don't have time to do so much, but these are some definitions that get you started to understanding what we're looking at. 
Um, and one of the questions in the chat when about the CO1 gene, yes, the CO1 gene that we're using is unique. Uh, it's, it's fairly unique for most species, uh, which is why we use that. And we'll talk more about that in episode three. So the question is, does BLAST tell me what species identify? And the answer is no, it does not. <laughs> so why are we doing it? Uh, well, BLAST helps us a lot. And we're going to do the BLAST in Subway as our last step here. But BLAST tells us it has some limitations. BLAST is a homology search, a similarity search. And so we assume um, that species that are in the database um, that they're related to what we're putting into the query speech. If that assumption is true, um, then when we're searching by homology, we're likely to get something that's good. But BLAST always returns its best result. And that's not guaranteed to be the true result. So if the species you're looking for is not in the database, but a closely related species is, well, BLAST will give the closely related species you know, as the, as the hit. So if I tell you that I want bananas, and you come back to me with an orange, well, you know, if you have no other fruit in your kitchen, well, an orange might be the closest thing, and I'll just have to live with that. It's not a banana. So BLAST will always find the best possible match, but it's not guaranteed that that is a true match. And the other thing is, is that when we get in a little bit more into the science of barcoding, and that'll be more important next week, and I'm telling you a lot of things are coming next week, so I better deliver. Barcodes are often good for the genus level resolution, so not necessarily species level. And if you add more barcodes, if you look at more than one location in the genome, then you start to be able to get even more resolution and be a little bit more confident. And I use that word resolution um, you know, very, you know, de, you know, with a, with a, with a deliberate uh, nature. Actually, the word resolution, you probably think about it from hopefully optics. And resolution in optics is if I have two different things, uh, can I tell if they're two different things? If I have two different peaks, you know, at a certain resolution, they look like two distinct blobs. But if I have, you know, not good resolution, then they look like one thing when they're actually two things. And that's kind of an analogy you might think. What's the resolution of a barcode? Well, so the barcode might actually look very similar for two closely related species, even when they're different species. And so you may need more data to do that. So let's do our BLAST search. And then what's coming up next time is going to be sequence alignments. So we're going to go to Subway. And this doesn't take very long. And it's where we're going to end for today. And back on DNA Subway, what we want to do is we're going to go ahead and close this window. And we're going to go ahead and click on BLAST N. And we're going to go ahead. We can go ahead with a horse slide and click BLAST and give it a few seconds. And it's going to go ahead and do that BLAST search in um, the DNA subway database, which is not 100% the same as the NCBI database, but we do update it. So I'm going to give it a few seconds. And hopefully it's done in just the next moment. And the goal for you, if you're following along, is to go ahead and complete all of these BLAST searches. I'm probably only going to get to one or two of them, depending on how slow it is. And then uh, you can go ahead and uh, complete them all and have them ready for next week. In next week's course, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. I'll come back to this when uh, it's done with the BLAST search. So in next week's course, we are going to uh, talk about multiple sequence alignments, a little bit more on the barcoding genes themselves and phylogenetics, because the combination of BLAST and the combination of phylogenetics uh, allows us to make at least a little bit better determination of what species we might be looking at. And so make sure you go to the DNA Learning Center live page, and you'll also have a series of uh, handouts and slides there too. Okay, let's go back and check on our subway. Let's go this way. Ah, okay, great. So that finished. And we're coming back now with the DNA subway. It looks very, very similar uh, to the NCBI blast. If I click on the name of a species, oftentimes I will get uh, photos, uh, which is wonderful. And I, I have links to the Encyclopedia of Life. If I click on any of those, it'll take me and it'll tell me that I've got, uh, a, in this case, a blowfly, right? Uh, so I was anticipating a horsefly. So I think that this is a, at least a very clear, close relative to it. And if I go back to DNA Subway, I get some information 
I've got really low expectation values. I've got lo a low number of mismatches. So these are all looking good. And what I can even do if I'm interested, I can click on one of those and add these to my project and save them for later. I can go back and I can do another. Uh, we'll see if we got the mosquito. We've got one more minute left if we keep this to 60 minutes. And while we're winding down here, I'll just invite anybody in the chat if you have any last questions. I see our moderator, who I think is Lena, is helping us today. Um, what we'll also do, there's a question about uh, papers. Uh, and if there's something that we can post, uh, we'll also post it to the uh, DNA Learning Center's uh, main page as well, the resources page. Maybe we'll see if that's available for next time. Try to choose uh, things that are not behind paywalls. The blast paper, I think, is not. Um, the paper is probably behind a paywall, but the abstract is not. All right, so that's going to continue on. Uh, if it comes to give me a mosquito uh, before we're done in the next three seconds, it will. Uh, the question from the chat is, what does the R mean? The R means that it's running, and it will continue to run. In fact, I can close DNA Subway, and it'll go there. So we'll save that for next time, because I want to keep it to an hour. And I'm looking to see if we have any last questions from the chat. I don't at the moment. Uh, but what you're going to see, what you should do on your own, is go ahead and run the BLAST searches for all of those. Hopefully know a little bit more about what BLAST is doing. It's able to search for those things. And then once we have all of the BLAST search results in all of our sequences, we're going to build file genetic trees so we can really see those barcodes and do some comparisons. So thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you uh, like the and subscribe to our YouTube channel, all of our social media, and we'll see you next time. Take care.